Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to webinar 26. Uh, let's have a look. We've got 30 people in the room, the virtual room. Wow, that's going up fast. Um, tell us who you are, where you are in the world, um, what kind of social work you do. Are you even a social worker? Um, and let's have a chat while we get everybody into the room. Wow, 100 people. That was fast. You're obviously all geared up for tonight. Um, I know that I definitely am. Exclusive um, new content we've been promised. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, 150. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Night. Oh, people are in the chat. Let's have a look. Southampton working with adults. Excellent. Oh, first year. Ah, first year student is we get we get this every week. UOB is that Bradford, Birmingham, or is it Bedfordshire as well? I saw oh, another yeah. UOB last week. Well, yeah. Mm. We need to know. Oh, a best, <laughs> best assessor. Excellent mm. students. Oh, no, there you go. You've already got dinner in there. Chicken stir fry with whole grain you rice. Guys, you can ask. Right, I'm sorry, guys, but you can't blame me for this. I, I'm not <laughs> responsible for this. But I do want to say, on Christmas Day, what do you have? What do you eat? You don't want to say it, do you? Too much. You know, you know what the answer is, don't you? Christmas dinner. Yeah, not lunch. Not tea. Dinner. You have a Christmas lunch, you don't have a Christmas tea. Um, you have a Christmas <laughs> dinner. So it is breakfast, dinner and when tea. When do you have it though? But when do you have it? Well, all the wheels go out the out the window on Christmas. We know that. So yeah, you have chocolate for breakfast on Christmas. Yeah, you can eat you can eat your own body weight. So we're going to make a start and uh, the team will mute themselves now to start off with, but we'll be joined back by the team again as the session tonight goes on. So we're doing a back to basics webinar tonight. Every now and again, we like to get back to the basics of reflective practice and theory, just to remind us of the importance of those as key building blocks, I suppose, of our social work practice. And when we first started these webinars, um, 27 weeks ago, which is why we've decided to take a break at tonight, because it's exactly half a year, 26 weeks. So we've done these webinars every week for exactly half a year. And when we first started these webinars, we started them to be all about theory and reflection because they are the foundations of our practice as social workers. So tonight we're going back to the basics of reflective practice. When you kind of look up back to basics you very often see building blocks like those the ABC kind of building blocks so what we thought we would do tonight was we thought well we'll look at the building blocks of reflective practice but we'll also remember that reflective practice provides the building blocks for good social work practice so I suppose the two are connected together. We've done 26 webinars there are 26 letters in our alphabet and it's usually when you have building blocks like that they normally have letters on them so that you can spell things out when you build them up as that picture so what we thought we would do for tonight as a bit of fun and as some entirely new content that we've actually worked really hard on together we thought we'll go through the a to z of reflective practice now, as I go through each building block, you might want to decide what word do you think begins with A that might relate into reflective practice? And then we're going to go through every letter of the alphabet. So I don't know. I can't see the chat because I'm uh, doing the screen sharing and doing the presentation at the moment. I can't see the chat, but I'm hoping that in the chat you're putting down what words you think I might be going to that begin with the letter A that relates to reflective practice. And I'm going to take you into the very first word of tonight where there will be clearly 26 words that relate to reflective practice and I suppose 26 words that provide the foundation building blocks of reflective practice. So in reflective practice A is for aptitude. It could have been for attitude as well which is only one letter different but aptitude is all about skill isn't it? You can have an aptitude for something, it's a natural ability, the word aptitude means a natural ability and some people do have a natural ability for reflection and they can almost in some ways do it without thinking. 
some people can write reflectively really naturally without needing to think about it too much or work on it too much. But for many of us, reflective practice isn't something that just happens. It's a skill and the skill takes practice. You need to work at it. There's no magic wand that's just going to make you suddenly be able to reflect. Um, there are some tricks, though, that you can use. And ahead of tonight, one of the emails that we got posed a question for us. And, you know, you, you, know you can post questions either in the chat or in the Q&A through this evening when you're attending live. But we were sent a question by email ahead of tonight. And the question was, what advice would you give to somebody, a first year student who is writing reflectively for the first time? And I think the advice that I'd give is make sure it's not the first time that you're writing reflectively. Keep writing reflectively all of the time. I think you should start to write reflectively at the end of your first week of learning as a social worker. So the end of your first week at university, write something reflective. OK, you're not writing to an essay title, but you're writing something reflective. You've just got to keep practicing. That's the thing. This isn't something that just happens. It isn't something that you can just five times a year write a reflective essay and that's when you do it you have to work at reflection so there are no uh there is no magic wand as i say but there are some tricks and we think that reflective practice prompt cards can definitely help both with the practicing and with the tricks i would suggest to you that you try and take 10 minutes on a regular basis to reflect. Even if it's once a week, get your reflective practice prompt cards out and just take a look at one of the cards. It's almost like that trick, that magic trick, pick a card, any card. I would literally say that there are 52 cards in the reflective practice prompt card set. We know loads of you have got them. There's 52 cards in that prompt card set, one for every week of the year so that you can pick it out and reflect regularly. I did ask the Connect team what was their favourite reflective card to prepare for the session. I think some of them are probably going to hold it up to the screen if they've got the cameras on at the moment. There you go. Some of them might put it in the chat. What's their reflective practice? Because if they hold up the card, some people are going invisible, so they can't hold them up. <laughs> if they've got a background, they turn invisible. Um, but they might put in the chat, what's their favorite card? The key thing you've got to do is keep practicing. But for that person who asked, what advice would you give for the first time of reflective writing, other than saying, do it before you have to, don't do it just for the... Uh, the first time you write is the first time you hand in an assignment. The key thing I'd say is watch back our reflective writing webinar. So I think in the chat now, the team are going to put the link in to the reflective writing webinar, which has been a really popular watch back on YouTube. So A was for aptitude. B, what's B going to be for, do you think? What's going to be B? of reflective practice let's see if you're putting anything there into the chat and i will tell you the b that i chose and i had lots of words beginning with b uh, i had lots of words beginning with most of the letters and i had to prioritize but beginning with b i went for barriers there are lots of different barriers to reflective practice and lots of things that get in the way you need to understand what's stopping you from being reflective. Sometimes it's, some people are reluctant to reflect because actually reflection can create a crisis of confidence. We all know that as a student social worker out on practice and certainly as a newly qualified social worker, people very often have a sense of like the imposter syndrome and can feel really lacking in confidence. And sometimes reflection doesn't help build your confidence, actually leads to more of a crisis in your confidence. So that might be a barrier for you. What is it that's getting in your way? What can you do to overcome those barriers and what help might you need? That's really important for you to think through. Now, if you're typing into the chat at the moment, the key barriers for you in terms of reflective practice, I don't know what they might be. They'll be really varied because everyone has different barriers to reflective practice. But I'll tell you what people tell me. Once they're qualified, 
the biggest barrier that I ever hear from social workers is time, a lack of time. Everyone feels like I just don't have the time to reflect. I've not even got time to think. How do we find time to reflect? But actually, reflective practice in many ways slows us down in order to speed us up. Taking a little bit of time for reflection actually enhances practice and really can speed us up in the longer term. So taking that time is essential. Time to reflect is important. Talk to your manager about needing time to reflect. Make sure that you get time to reflect. But be conscious of the barriers and everybody's barrier is going to be different. As I say, this is one of the main barriers that social workers tell me in terms of reflection. Now, because tonight is the last time you're going to see us for about a month, uh, maybe even for maybe even five, six weeks, actually, when I think about it, what we thought was that everybody in the team would get involved tonight. So I gave everybody on the team the option to choose a letter and then they could do whatever they wanted with that letter. And the first letter that someone made a claim to was the letter C. And for the letter C, I'm going to hand over to Chris, who will tell you her letter, well, her word beginning with the letter C. Hello. So for me, C is really about contemplation and contemplation means being in deep thought reflective thought about something and I think that's really important to give us a bit of clarity over it I quite often find that um, if I find somewhere quiet to go and sit or ideally somewhere like the picture but that's not always possible um, actually it helps me to kind of be relaxed and find the right mindset to be able to think about things in a different way sometimes for me just sleeping on it actually gives me that clarity and I think my subconscious is just getting on with the contemplation while I'm asleep. Thanks for that Chris. Do you know what I think is really interesting when other people go with a letter is um, what they come up with because C would not have been, contemplation would not have been the one one that I would have even thought of in terms of I had loads of C's written down and it just wasn't one I'd have gone to and in a way you've almost gone for a double C because you've gone for contemplation and clarity because you used yeah. both of those um when you were talking then and I tell you what's interests me about the letter C in a way is there's so many words that relate to social work that begin with the letter C do you remember we did the um, webinar about all the P's of placements and actually there were loads and loads of P's but there are loads of C words that relate into social work so in the reflective practice prompt cards it's just come to me and I've thought of it before there's a model for um, C so there's there's four the four F's of reflection for example is one of the cards um, Kelly knows I go on a lot about the four P's you always make a joke about I'm always bringing up the four P's but actually the C the model that's about C's I think it's written by John's but I'm not sure about who wrote it but it's 10 C's they couldn't even bring it down to four it was 10 10 C's there's that many and even in the 10 C's I don't think it uses the word contemplation so it's just interesting how many different words there are beginning with the letter to C. And I did wonder whether Chris chose the letter C because her name begins with the letter C. And that might pan out if we go to the letter D and which team member might have chosen the letter D. And it follows on that Diana, whose name begins with the letter D, chose the letter D. So Diana, do you want to tell us about your word beginning with the letter D? Yes, actually. Determination. And I think Hannah's already put it in. So great minds think alike. Um, I'm keeping my camera off because the lighting is terrible in this room right now. But um, the reason why I chose determination, apart from the fact that it starts with a D, is the idea that linking to what um, Siobhan was talking about in terms of barriers, 
a lot of the times you do need that extra push and that determination to get past those barriers. And for me, it's trying to understand what does determination look like to you? Because it can look like so many different things. It can be small things. It can be big things. What motivates you to get to that end goal or to get through um, your day, if that makes sense. And then when you relate it back to reflective practice, it's understanding, okay, how do I get to a, a deeper level of thought? How do I enable myself to actually engage with these different reflective models? Um, and how do I put that in my practice day to day? I think that's like really interesting that determination doesn't have to be or oh, just being strong because a lot of the times you think that it's related to just being strong but it's not it's related to the way that you think um as i put there at the end determination is not about strength it's the way of thinking it's your mindset it's the way that you push through things um sometimes determination might be reminding yourself of your goals or Sometimes for me, it's just like thinking about how I can make today a better day than yesterday. That's that's reflective thinking. That's reflective practice. You can ingrain it in your way of living. So it's not just social work. Um, it's actually your life. And that in itself is thought provoking and challenging in a way. But you need to get it so that you're able to apply it to the people that you work with. So that's why I went with determination. I love that. Thanks, Diana. I love that. Um, making it part of our daily life and not just about our social work practice. I think that's really important. And in a way, as you say, that determination links back to the barriers because you've got to have determination to overcome the barriers. But it also links back to the A of aptitude. We've got to have determination to keep practicing, to develop that. It's not just naturally. It's not just something that happens. We've got to work at it. So that's great. Thank you for that. So then we're going to go to the letter E and what might the word be that begins with the letter E? I don't know what you're putting in the chat. As I say, I can't see in the chat, but I'm pausing each time to give you the option of thinking about what word you think might uh, begin with the letter E that relates into reflective practice. Now I've gone for the word emotions, especially at the moment. Social work is emotional work. What we need to do is include a consideration of our emotions in reflection. How might our emotions impact on our work? What impact might our emotions have on our practice? And how might our, how might our emotions be impacted by our work? So it's a cyclical process, this thinking about emotions, how we feel impacts on the work that we do. The work that we do impacts on how we feel. And so emotions and feelings are a key aspect to being reflective and to reflecting on our practice. And I think it's important that we consider not only our own emotions, but the emotions of other people involved in the situation so that we have this real holistic view of the emotional context of the practice that we're involved in. We know and we've talked about when we did, I think it was webinar three, when we were talking about um, theory as it relates to the pandemic we talked about moral injury and the way in which we might experience moral injury because of new ways of working and we know that reflection is one of the key factors in preventing moral injury in mitigating the impact of moral injury so reflection isn't just something that we do to write an essay or to pass an assessment reflection is a key part of our self-care as social workers, reflecting on what's happening for us, being reflective in the moment is a key way of looking after ourselves, thinking about our own emotional health and well-being. So thinking through the emotional context of practice is essential. And then we're going to go for F, the letter F. Now, one of the one of my favourite models of reflection is Greenaway's four Fs. So I was fairly certain that that was what I would go for when I came to the letter F. But actually, when I prioritised and I looked through and I tried to make sure that we had everything we needed for reflective practice in this A to Z, I decided to plump for feedback. 
because feedback and reflection are so closely connected, really, we know that reflection that doesn't include considering feedback from others can become introspective and stagnant. It just becomes a bit navel gazing. I think this reflection involves what I think, but it also involves drawing on what other people might think and what other people might suggest and how other people see things. So drawing on feedback in our reflection is essential. There's some research here that isn't from social work, but is about how um, professional performance improves. And there's research that says that reflection that's based on feedback or reflection that's combined with feedback significantly enhances performance. But where we get reflection without feedback or feedback without reflection, that doesn't lead to any measurable improvement in performance. So actually what we should be doing is bringing together reflection and feedback. Those of you who are students and newly qualified workers, you'll know that you have to gather feedback on your practice from the people that you seek to support, so service users, and also from other professionals and also from your manager and a kind of everyone that surrounds you is asked to provide you with feedback. And that feedback and how you reflect on it is a key part of how you actually improve your practice as a practitioner. So most programmes will ask you not only for the feedback, but also for your reflection on that feedback. So the two of these are connected together, but there is an art to both giving feedback in a constructive way and to receiving feedback. You need to be open to receiving feedback. There's an art to how do you accept feedback? How do you provide feedback to others? And I suppose I would ask you to take a moment to reflect on how good a feedback artist are you? And I suppose that means in terms of receiving feedback, do you become incredibly defensive if somebody tries to give you feedback? I can tell you as a practice educator, it takes a huge deal actually for us to give feedback to people. And I know sometimes if I'm giving feedback to somebody that is, um, I try to make sure it's always constructive, but the feedback might be critical, it might be negative. And I put a lot of thought into how I'm going to try and provide that feedback to somebody. But you also need to put a lot of thought into how you receive that feedback and not step in straight into being defensive. And I know we looked at that on our practice learning webinar, um, but the art of feedback is important, both for giver and receiver of feedback. So there's our F. Now, what about G? And at this point, I'm going to hand over again, but this time to someone whose name doesn't begin with the letter G. So we kind of lost it after Chris and Diana. It didn't pan out. I thought that was what was going to happen, but it, it didn't. Um, so Omar, you went for the letter G. Do you want to tell us about the G of reflective practice? Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry for ruining it. I just, <laughs> it's not that I couldn't think of a word for O, it's just that G is such... Um, a key word for me because as soon as I think of reflection I just think of growth um, and yeah I think that's just because you know reflection for me has always been about growth um, if I think about who I was a year ago I'm just a completely different person um, I definitely would not have been able to present in front of hundreds of people like today <laughs> in events and take opportunities that require skills that were just kind of completely out of my reach a year ago without this growth and I think I have to really thank reflection for my growth as reflection is what has kind of allowed, kind of enabled and empowered and that kind of thing, me to grow. Um, I have to give all the credit to Diana as we've kind of, you know, reflected throughout the year together, probably every day, which probably means Diana's very, very tired of me. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like, you know, with this image that we've got on the screen, you know, we are all the seed in the first picture and the water is kind of the reflection and the more you water the kind of seed the more you grow um and obviously you know that's you know through the watering can I feel like Diana is probably my watering can she probably is the one who kind of keeps watering me keeps enabling me to reflect and that kind of thing but like I feel like we I feel like the goal is everyone should be finding their own watering can and that doesn't have to be someone else it, it can be yourself um 
and you, you know it can be through methods such as you know reflective writing and things like that but find your watering your watering can and you will continue to grow through reflection <laughs> I, I, that's got to be uh my quote of yours that that's <laughs> the best quote of yours so far omar i think find your watering can um of reflection that's a definite i'm sure that's going on social media now because it's a great standout quote find your watering can of reflection um but what you're talking about there is as diana as your watering can the um the academic phrase is another one that begins with the letter C, which is probably the C I would have gone for if Chris hadn't have said, can I have the C? Because I would have probably gone for critical friend. And actually, we all need a critical friend to be a reflector. And, uh, you know, I think that's probably what Diana is to you, is your critical friend. Um, but a watering can's a much nicer image. So it was uh, it was fine to lose the C from the critical friend perspective. So thank you for that. Then we're going to go on to the H of reflection. I never know how to say this. Do you say H or H or anyway, the H of reflection? Uh, what's the H of reflection going to be for us? And reflecting on this, the word that I thought was perhaps the most important around the letter H is honesty. I think it is so important to be open and honest and transparent in our reflections. But what I would ask you to think about is to what extent are we actually truly honest in reflections that we're going to share with other people? So if you're going to write a reflective account, how honest is that reflective account really or how much are we thinking about the assessment criteria and whether we're ticking the boxes that we need to tick is it really reflection when we're writing it down to share it with somebody else even when you're reflecting in peer group supervisions or in reflection with your team members is it really reflection or is it, are you saying what you think other people want to hear? It's very important to be open and honest in our reflection. I remember many years ago, um, fairly early in my um, career as a practice educator, although not right at the start, I read an article by Graham Ixer, who was the head of, this is like a history lesson for some of you, was the head of what was called SETSWA, which you, is kind of a little bit like Social Work England is now, but they were the, they did the, they were called Central Council for Education and Training in Social Work. So they weren't a regulatory body, but they looked at the education and training of social workers. And Graham Mixer wrote an article, a journal article called There's No Such Thing as Reflection. And it, and it got loads of people up in arms about the title of this. You know, it's terrible, it's terrible. But actually the title was there to, to be provocative, I think, and to ask people to read beyond the title into the journal article. And really what that article was saying was, we all understand reflection as something different. And when we're asking people to write reflectively, is it really reflection? Because are we really being honest when we know that someone else is going to read it and someone is going to mark it? And I think there's some truth in that, really. And I do think we need to be honest about this. What is academic reflection and what is just our own personal reflection? That is something that I think, you know, we could we could think about the differences here. And for honesty, rather than going for an image on the screen, I looked at some quotations about honesty and I, I really like Thomas Jefferson said, honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. And that's true, really, you know, to be wise, to develop practice wisdom, which is essential in social work, we need to be honest. And honesty is the fastest way to prevent a mistake from turning into a failure. That's really important in terms of reflection. And of course, there's the old um, proverbs of honesty is the best policy and the first step towards greatness is to be honest. But perhaps the favourite quotation I've got there is from Mother Teresa, who said, honesty and transparency make you vulnerable, but be honest and transparent anyway. And I think that's really important. Reflection makes us vulnerable, but there is strength in our vulnerability and being able to share our vulnerabilities as social workers together is an important aspect of shared reflection. So that's our H of reflection. What about the I? 
Now, the eye is fascinating, isn't it? Because you almost don't need to add a word to the eye because the eye can stand alone in terms of reflection. So I thought about that. I toyed with that. I thought, do I even add a word on or do I just say the eye of reflection is I? But I went down a different road. So I went with the word that I connected to I was imagination. And that's because I think one of my favourite quotations about reflective practice of all times comes from Biggs, 1999. A reflection in a mirror is an exact replica of what's in front of it. But reflection in professional practice gives back not what it is, but what it might be, an improvement on the original. And I think one of the most important things, especially for students, but also for qualified practitioners, is to be able to imagine a new way, a different way of working. And sometimes when things are particularly challenging and when we are so challenged politically with things like austerity, it's vital that we can reimagine social work. We can think about social work being done in a different way. It's not about, whenever I see the words or hear the words in a reflection where somebody says, I had to, I always think, is that really reflection? Because did you really have to? You could have imagined another way. What's another way? Let's be more imaginative, more creative in our work as social workers. But also when you're writing assignments, reimagine things. You can talk about this was the policy, this is what government expected, but how might it be if we did have a magic wand, if we could see things in a completely different way? Imagine new ways of working. We visited in the webinar about the pandemic, we visited crisis theory. If you remember, we talked about crisis intervention and the three stages of crisis. And I said, that the third stage of crisis is often referred to as reimagining something. And actually, I would say that's really where we need to be looking in our reflection is reimagining new ways of working, new ways of seeing what happened and what could happen. So imagination is the word that I think begins with I that relates into reflection. I don't know if there's any questions in the chat or any, are we about halfway through the letters of the alphabet? I don't know if there's any, are there any questions to team? I'm asking the team now. There Chris. isn't any in the Q&A, um, Siobhan. Mm -hmm. It was just mainly in relation to where they could find the reflective cards. Okay. I'm not sure if anything's coming in the chat. Is there anything in the chat? And Kelly's saying no. Okay. Well, I'm going to carry on if that's okay. Are people joining in in the chat, Kelly, with here are some words? Are we getting people? Have I got some J words going in at the moment then? Have we got, let's let's see what people think begin with J. Let's give people. In Justification. The Justification, a good one. Justice. Justice. Joint Joint working. Joint working working joy joy that's a good one actually. same couple of words but like just going up and yeah. down, up and down. Journal. journaling journaling that's that's an individual journaling. one yeah journaling it's still none of the ones i've used but there judgment. Go. I'm, try I'm trying to channel you siobhan like what would you put <laughs> judgmental journey oh journey. there would be a good one yeah it's still none of those I went, for, <laughs> I went for, for the letter J, I went for join the dots. For me, you see, reflection is all about creating connections. I keep using that word, don't I? I overuse the word connections, I think, is my own personal reflection. So with the team tonight, you know, we're doing social work student connect webinars. Everything in social work should be about creating reflection connections and that's what reflection is i've done today i've done three reflective connections sessions that's what they're called the the sessions that i deliver uh with groups are called reflective connections sessions and that's what it's all about reflection is all about creating connections so you should be thinking through things like 
how does what I experienced here connect to what I experienced with that person? How does this connect with what I did there? How does what's happening for this person connect to what's happening in their systems or just connections? You need to think about how does the whole A to Z that we've done tonight, how does that connect together? Because to imagine something, we need to be able to join the dots together to see what it might look like. Everything that we're talking about connects together. And good social work is connected social work. So for me, the J is join the dots. And then we're going to go on to the K. Now, what about the K? There could be loads of words here. I've thought about all kinds of words for the letter K. There are so many different things. And I did really, I really struggled actually to prioritize between two. I thought maybe kindness is important. We've got a lot of kindness going into the chat. A lot of kindness. And I did, I did kind of ponder kindness, being kind to ourselves when we reflect is really important. But I thought maybe that could come into one of the other letters more. So I did go with, and I'm thinking this is surely going to be in the chat. I went with knowledge. Yeah, that's in there. There you go. I went with knowledge because reflection should always include a consideration of knowledge. But when you're writing reflectively or even when you're talking reflectively in maybe a reflective supervision, don't just state the knowledge that you used, but make sure you explore the knowledge that you've used. Where does that knowledge come from? What does the knowledge say about you or about the profession and so on? Think about things like our Connect Team members, Diana and Omar, are working on the decolonization of the social work curriculum. This stuff's really important. Where does the knowledge come from that we're using? If this knowledge is completely Eurocentric, if it's completely from white men, you know, what's the, what does that say to everybody else? Can we see ourselves in the knowledge base that we're drawing on? Do you see yourself reflected in the knowledge that you're using? Think about where the knowledge comes from. Think about what that says to about us, about the profession reflection and true deep reflection on knowledge helps us to develop new knowledge it gives us new understanding and maybe crucially that's what practice wisdom is all about practice wisdom is the knowledge that you develop from your experiences the wisdom that you grow as a practitioner it's essential it's a key part of being reflective but kindness is important too i'm hoping that will come up later maybe with a slightly different word so we're going to go to another team member now and um this time becky went for the letter l so becky do you want to tell people your choice of the letter l i don't know what's going in the chat at the moment around the letter l but becky you can go with yours okay so I chose L because of the light bulb moments that I've had throughout the webinars, which have really helped me to um, reflect. Um, so I just wondered if anybody else was a light bulb learner like me. Um, I used to struggle to write reflectively because I think that I can quite easily blur the lines and sort of go into descriptive writing rather than reflective writing. So the fact that I'm a visual learner um it, the webinars in particular they kind of they really help me because I like the combination of the clear use of language that often Siobhan and the guest speakers have used combined with like that strong visual connection the amazing like illustrations we get from Rosie and and bits and bobs because that just really helps me then um when I'm reflecting so light bulb moments for me are when like a little light just comes on in my head and then all of a sudden I'm sort of sitting there and I can see the link between the theory and the practice because I've got a clearer understanding of it. Because when I've sat then and reflected on an interaction or a learning opportunity, or I've just listened to somebody else's experiences, it's like I can visualize it. So, um, and I think just the last thing was like, sometimes um, a meaningful, but a, a simple phrase really helps me when I'm reflecting. So the art of analysis, we had a guest speaker on called Yusuf and he just, 
he just said these three words about being the difference and it's stuck with me ever since um because I just find that sometimes when I feel a bit overwhelmed and I'm sitting down I will just start with that short phrase and it just helps break down the whole experience for me and I just you know I just think about sort of like how can I be the difference blah blah and then I kind of break it down and figure it out from there so that's my light bulb learning. Thanks Becky I love that I love that having a simple phrase that you can go back to and always lights up your reflection I really like that um and and I think I'm very much a well everybody knows I'm very much a visual learner so I completely identify with what you were saying there so thank you for sharing those light bulb moments with us in your L and so we're going to go on to the letter M and M I have picked out as is for models because for me, one of the things I think is the most important is that you are clear about the model of reflection that you're using. And there's so many different models of reflection. And I know the reflective practice prompt cards, probably about 30 of them relate to models of reflection. So that shows you just how many different models of reflection that there are. You can use different models uh, for different situations. What model suits me, my favorite model might really not work for you as a model of reflection. So different models work for different people. We've just heard Becky saying she's a visual learner, but some people are verbal learners that, that the same model won't work for people. So think about for yourself, how many models are you familiar with? How many models of reflection do you use? You wouldn't use the same technique with every single person that you work with as a social worker. Neither should you use the same model of reflection for every situation you're reflecting on. So for example, the weather model, which lots of people like, is really good, but for reflecting on a long period of time where for a single incident, it may not be so good about that. So different models, you need to have a variety of different models. I would suggest try using two different models to reflect on the same situation. That's really helpful for assignment writing. So if you're going to write an assignment or you're going to write a reflective account for a portfolio, think about the incident or the situation that you're going to write about. Get out a few of the reflective practice prompt cards and go through three or four of the cards cards to help your thinking to prompt you into how to write use different models as a practice educator I actually encourage a different reflective model each time we have supervision so I have a reflective model of the week and we use a different model each session and I try and mix it up so that some of the models I use are process models and some are component models I don't want to repeat material that we've already done in previous webinars. So in webinar 10, and the team will put the link into the chat now for webinar 10, if you didn't go or if you want to watch it back again on YouTube, we talked through the difference between process and component models. And we had people sharing their own self-created models of reflection, which is something I'd suggest to you develop your own model of reflection. They're great. Some of the models that people have created. Um, I was in a session last week where someone was referring to Ngozi's boat model and how helpful it had been and kind of referenced that. Um, so different people use different models of reflection. N. N is for next steps. Reflection should always consider what are you going to do next? Where are you going to go with this? What can you do to move things forward? What can you do to take the next steps? What can you do to change your practice? Everything should be about what next? What's going to happen now? Sometimes your reflection might lead to loads of ideas about what you can change, what needs to be done differently. Be honest about that. But really try and prioritize what's the most important next step, because you can't do 100 things at once. So if you look at all of these things need doing, what's the most single most important next step? Because every journey we take begins with a single step. So from my perspective, the most important thing is What's the single step that you're going to take and how are you going to take that? And let's get movement happening, but with a single step at a time. And then the O. 
What about the O? What words might you get into that chat that begin with the letter O? And this is kind of where I started to bring kindness in. OK, kindness doesn't begin with O, but what I went for was keeping things optimistic because once we put the word critical into reflection, it's really hard to then put a positive spin on it, to see it positively. A lot of people, because they hear the word critical in the phrase critical reflection, think that we have to reflect on what didn't go well, think that we have to think about the negatives in a situation. What do we have to do differently? What should we change? What did I do wrong even? That we become very self-critical. And actually we need to be kind to ourselves now, perhaps more than ever. But when we're reflecting, we need to keep the balance here, not just looking at what didn't work well, but also looking at what did go well. You need to learn the positive lessons as well. We need to be kind to ourselves. We need to think about what did work well, because then we can repeat it. If we're constantly thinking about what didn't work, we're not thinking about the things that are working. And a lot of what we do does work. So let's keep focused on what we could do in a similar way next time. In actual fact, when we think about the word critical, it's not about thinking about things negatively. It's actually about the word that I chose to begin with the letter P. There are loads of words that could begin with the letter P, but I literally had only one single choice when talking about reflection, particularly when we talk about critical reflection, and it had to be power. We have to think about power. When we talk about critical reflection, it means that we add in issues of the power and the socio-political context of our practice. So we could even give it a double P, a bit like Becky did with light bulb and learning. We could have gone for power and politics, really. And maybe that was me reflecting back. Maybe I should have done that. Those P's are really important. Now, Kelly will know I go on about the four P's all the time. And Kelly says to me, have you added any more in? And you seem to add in an extra P every time you talk about it, which is true, Kelly. Absolutely true. But I had to go with power, which isn't even one of the four P's. But I had to do it because when we put critical in, as I said, everybody thinks it means looking at what didn't go well. But actually, it's about power. And power is intrinsic in every aspect of social work practice power is there. And so social workers have to develop a clear understanding of the way that power operates, of the way that power can be deconstructed, of everything, so that we can work positively with the power in our role. And it's important to remember how complex the construction of power is and really take time to reflect on power and how we can deconstruct power. If you remember webinar eight, we talked about power and the construction of power, how power is built on so many levels. And that little illustration there is taken from how we broke down power in that webinar. So if you haven't watched that and you want to be critically reflective, go watch that because power is all critical reflection is all about power. Then there's your P. What about Q? Now, Q is one of those, Q is the letter you never want to get in Scrabble, really, isn't it? Unless you've definitely got a U and even then you're always a bit suspect. Am I going to be able to get this out on the board? It's why you score 10 on the letter Q, isn't it? But Q, there were lots of words beginning with Q that I could have gone with for reflection. And I thought about being quiet because sometimes you need a bit of quiet in order to be reflective. But then I thought, well, is that covered by Chris's word contemplation? So I went along with questions. The cue of reflective practice is all about dynamic, thought-provoking questions, asking yourself lots of questions and digging deeper. Not simply one question or I've reflected. A question should follow a question should follow a question. The questions should be circular. As the images show there, the word questions is going round and round and round on the question mark. I find sometimes some people can become defensive when I'm asking them a reflective question, almost as though I'm questioning their very being. But if your practice educator just says to you, why did you do it like that? It's not 
they're not you don't need to defend yourself it's not they're not saying you did it wrong they just want to understand your thought process because i'm not a mind reader obviously it is the tone that, that illustrates something you know if someone why did you do it like that clearly that's not a reflective question but it is a reflective question to say why do you think that why did you see it like that that's not trying to have a go at you that's trying to understand your thought process so don't get defensive when being asked questions questions should lead into other questions and constantly connected questions can really help you to dig deeper and to take your reflection to the kind of level that it needs to go to ah oh, now for R, i'm going to hand you over to cat who is uh who chose the r you see, Kat's second name begins with R, so I wonder if that's why you went for the R, Kat, because you and Chris being friends, you knew Chris had gone for the C, so maybe you thought, I'll just go Well, she but did ask before she uh, before she put it in the group, That so I said, yeah, she can have the C and I'll have the R. <laughs> um, but actually, you talking about thought processes leads into this one for me, and I chose um, Ruminate. So I've um, had a mental health placement last this year for my final placement and it's something that was um, considered quite a lot and it can be thought of as quite negative but for me it helps me to think about the situation from different perspectives and potentially reflect on different areas that I wouldn't have initially. So I, it allows me to think about the different pathways that I'm going down in different situations yeah that's fab thank you for that cat so the image that i chose to go on there i didn't know if you might pick up that i did that because you talked about the pathways yes in thinking and um so i tried to find an image that might relate into the pathways in your thinking and i and i came up with that as a pathway that's both creative and colorful and dynamic because that's how i imagine the pathways in your thinking you see cat it's very definitely rather overwhelming at times but i think yeah once you've got it going you get get more on the straight and narrow i like to um put everything into little boxes but my mind's always going at 100 miles an hour so to think about the path and mm. consider different things that have happened along the way uh, it's definitely helped me to reflect more critically this year yeah and i think that's really important but sometimes the pathways can become a bit like a maze can't they that you can get stuck in and you can't get yourself back out of yeah 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 okay thank you for the r word thank you. so the letter s well i was struck with this one i was really i was thinking well in webinar two really really at the beginning of our webinar series webinar two we did all the s's of reflection we did the steps the stages the spaces and the structures of reflection so i thought what what am i going to go with there's so many s's if you've not watched that they'll put in i think again someone's going to put into the chat the link into that webinar which revisits all of those s's but the one i went with because i thought you know this is probably the one that has the most impact really is the stages of reflection it's simple but it's important to remember the three not two stages of reflection a lot of people will talk about the two stages of reflection that shern picked up reflecting in action which is what we do in the moment on the job whilst we're thinking and we change things up and he also talked about reflecting on action, which is what we do later. So as a team, we all get back together later after the webinar and just look back what worked and what didn't work and what might might we do differently. That's later. That's reflecting on action. But we also all of us need to reflect for action, which is the planning ahead, the thinking ahead. How do you reflect ahead of something? And that was added later by Killian and Tottenham so that what we should end up with is, as that illustration shows, a cycle of reflecting before, during and after. So we get plan something do something and then review something and to do something well you need to use all three of those stages as a team we plan the webinars together we deliver them together and then we review them together plan do and review is really important all three stages 
So we're whizzing through now because you, uh, you, you probably know that the end of the alphabet is going to be the most difficult to do in terms of letters for reflection. But T, well, that was fairly easy for me to work on what I was going to put there. And some of you will probably have guessed what T will be in the chat. But the T is theorizing. So this isn't just theory theorizing. Theorizing is slightly different. Theorizing is about how do we use theory in practice, but it's also about how do we use practice to test theory so that it informs theory in social work? How do we um, develop our own ideas about theory and our own ways of working? So you need to reflect on what theory you've used to understand what's going on in a situation. If it's relevant, include what model you've used to act or to intervene in a particular situation. But you know, if you've attended any of these webinars before, I talked to you about the importance of the what, why, how framework. So it's not just what theory have you used or what model have you used, it's why? Why that theory? Why that model? And how did it impact? So you have to use the what, the why and the how to really theorise on your practice. Then we're going to go to the you. And the you, this was an easy call. This was an easy call. It was kind of, they had a couple of words, but this was an easy call as to which one I was going to go for. Uncertainty. One of the key things about reflection is that you've got to be able to be willing to live with uncertainty. There are always going to be things that you don't know. Always. There's always going to be an element of uncertainty. In many ways, the only thing that we're sure of in social work is uncertainty. The only thing that is certain is uncertainty. In his report after the death of Victoria Climbier, um, Lord Laming talked about respectful uncertainty. And social workers need to be able to develop that sense of respectful uncertainty. But we do need to think about and reflect on what is safe uncertainty? What is it OK for us to not know? And what's unsafe uncertainty? What is it? We can't let go of that bit that we don't know because we need to know that it's not safe. If we if we're uncertain about that, it's not safe. There are some problems with uncertainty. Social workers will say it's really difficult to sit in supervision with my manager and say, I'm uncertain about that. I don't know about that, that we're almost pushed in contemporary social work to be certain, to have a yes or a no answer. But actually, very often we don't know. And um, Dewey here, Dewey is actually, I think a lot of people will say Shern is the kind of founding person of reflective practice but actually I think it's Dewey. Dewey wrote um talked about how people think he talked about thinking processes um, and actually Dewey supervised um Schoen's dissertation um so he was his supervisor and he says genuine ignorance is profitable because it's likely to be accompanied by humility by curiosity and by open-mindedness and those are all things that we need as social workers. We need to be professional. We need to have professional humility, professional curiosity and professional open mindedness. So not knowing sometimes is helpful to us. And as Albert Einstein said, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And that's true. Sometimes reflection creates uncertainty. The more we reflect, the more we realize we don't know. And that can in itself be challenging and why we need to be determined, as Diana said, to be reflective. And what about the V? I'll bet you everybody's got the V, the letter V for reflection. Everyone will have the V. The V is easy. The V is values. The values isn't easy, but knowing what the letter is, is easy. So values. This is an image taken from the reflective practice prompt cards that help us to think about all of the different values systems that there are in a situation. This isn't just about thinking about the difference between our personal and our professional values, which is clear. We need to do that as part of reflection. But it's also about thinking through organizational values. What are they? Because they're very often quite different to our own values. What about societal values? 
our professional values are not the only professional values in a situation. What about the service user's professional values? What about other people's professional values? What about other professions' professional values? There's a whole range of different value systems going on. And as this illustration is supposed to show, they can overlap. There can be conflict between them or there can be similarities and connections between them. But the values in any given situation is hugely complex. And sometimes it's helpful to reflect just thinking about values, nothing else, just take values and think about the values in a situation. There's your V, W. W is all about writing, reflective writing. Now we've covered this. We have done a whole webinar on reflective writing, webinar number four. Um, I've noticed it's one of the most watched back webinars on YouTube. So I think people want to know a lot about reflective writing. It's something that people really want to explore. Um, but effectively, what you've got to remember is in social work, in terms of the grading that you get if in your own in your initial training, in any qualified post-qualifying work you do afterwards, I suppose, any grading that you get, any qualification that you get, it's not, it's not based on what you're doing. It's based on how you write about what you're doing. And I think that's key. So even placements, your placements, obviously, what you do in practice matters. But the grade that you get will be about what you've written about how you do what you do. So reflective writing is really important. You might find just doing some sentence completion to start off with is helpful. So um, the person who asked us the question, um, what advice would you give to someone writing reflectively for the first time? One thing I'd say is just try to do some sentence completion that I'm aware of, I'm not sure about, I think about, I'm uncertain of. I. You could take literally every letter that we've done tonight and write a sentence about it as it relates to you or the situation that you're writing about. That might be helpful to you. There are lots of benefits to reflective writing. Firstly, it can help us to capture our reflection at the time and so helps you to revisit them. I've been 30 years qualified. I really love revisiting um, a reflective account that I wrote on my second placement. So that'll be 32 years ago. I love going back to it and rereading it and thinking about how far I've come since then. How much have I grown since then when Omar talks about that year growth in a year? Growth in 32 years is huge. So it's useful to be able to go back and revisit. Reflective writing can help clarify your thoughts and how you might express your thoughts. And it can help to reflect on whether you actually understand something or not. If you have to express it in writing, do you really understand it? Now, we're going to go for the difficult one now. We're going to go for the letter X. What do you think could be the X of reflective practice? And this is the key bit here. It's kind of whenever you look at any A to Z of anything, the X is always the one that's a problem, isn't it, for and I did think, well, should we do X-ray? Because, you know, you're kind of looking at things with a bit of X-ray vision. But I went with, let's try and join the dots. Let's try and make the connections. So actually, what we're going to do is the X marks the spot. The treasure map that's on the screen now, the treasure is at the X. So this is my treasure in terms of reflective practice and reflective writing. I'm going to ask you if you've got a pen and a piece of paper, quite a few of you are no take notes because I see you put pictures of it and stuff on social media afterwards. Write down those two words, just write down the word reflexivity and write down the word complexity. There's an X in both of those. And the X in both of those words is where the treasure of social work lies. Reflexivity happens when we're working in complexity. And reflexivity is the aim, really. We start with, as we did in webinar two, we start with reflection, we move to critical reflection and then to reflexivity. So we've explored how do we make that growth? And the X marks that growth. So if I said to you, write down those words now, look at the X. The X is where the treasure lies. Look at the X. What do you see next to the X? And there's a couple of things that you might see. You might see EI. Either side of the X is E, then I. And that's emotional intelligence. We connect 
emotional intelligence with reflection and it becomes reflexivity. The I is all about the self, isn't it? The I, I am, I am, I am reflective. I, the I, it's the you part. The I might also stand for individual factors or factors which are internal to the situation, whilst the E might stand for environmental factors or factors external to the situation. So the treasure, the real treasure of being a social worker is that we probably are the only professional group that see the individual in the context of their environment, that look at factors which are internal to the situation, as well as those which are external to the situation. And that is where the treasure of reflexivity lies. The X marks the spot, E and I. Always remember that. You've got in your head all of the time. We see the individual in the context of their environment and we connect emotional intelligence with our reflection. That's your X marks the spot. Y, what's the Y going to be for? Well, this is the last letter I'm going to do because you might have noticed that one of our team members who actually always starts off our sessions is going to end the alphabet for us tonight. So this is the last letter of the A to the Z that I'm going to do. And it's all about you. The Y has to stand for you. That's another of the uh, reflective practice prompt cards images there, getting you to think about yourself and your own role in a situation. Self-awareness is one of the most important aspects of reflective practice. Understanding yourself, how people see you, is intrinsically connected with reflection. Reflection involves considering your own self-awareness but self-awareness is increased through reflection. So the two of these are totally connected. They're like in a cycle. Self-awareness leads to and improves reflection and reflection leads to and improves self-awareness. It's a key thing. It's a cyclical nature. So I've done up to Y. We've done together the A to Z. And we're going to finish off with Kelly has taken the Z. And where I said for everybody else they'd chosen their letter. Poor old Kelly, I gave her the letter Z because when we were talking about this, I was saying, well, the only one I can't do is Z. And Kelly came up with at least three words beginning with Z that worked for reflective practice. So I've said, right, you're the queen of Z, you're having the Z. So it's over to Kelly for her word beginning with the letter Z. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, yeah, some of you have guessed it. My letter is, my word is zeal. Um, and I think that was the first guess. So um, well done. That's pretty good, actually. Um, so yeah, my, my word is zeal. Um, and when you think of zeal, you sometimes think it's like a really not, not a very positive word. Like if someone's zealous, they're a bit like a bit over enthusiastic or a bit militant with something. But um, I, see, I see kind of zeal as being enthusiastic, um, being motivated. Um, and I think kind of in social work in general, you've just got to do stuff like studying social work. You've just got to get involved. You've just got to be enthusiastic. You can't just go to your lectures. You just you can't just turn up. You've got to do stuff. Um, so I'm a kind of doing person. I like to get involved. What I don't find easy is to kind of sit and think and reflect that's definitely something I need to work on. Um, and I think for me, it's kind of trying different techniques, like Siobhan said, trying different theory cards and finding one that fits me and fits the situation and fits the person I'm working with. Um, Cause that's definitely a skill that I need to learn and I'm not there yet. And I'm gonna watch the reflective writing webinar again um, before I do any of my assignments. Um, so kind of just getting involved and finding um, different ways of doing things and being enthusiastic so that's that's my z word zeal thanks kelly um now you might say well ev that was the the word in the chat that people guessed because it's the only word beginning with z but it's not is it because you came up with other words beginning with z as well i don't know if people have put those in the chat as well um but i remember you had the zenith of reaching the peaks i was you know you had so many uh, options Kelly so thank you for that the letter Z so we have gone through with you the A to Z of reflective practice 
um, building the foundations. So in the A to Z so far, we've looked at building blocks, but often when you go back to basics, you also get an A to Z poster. And this is the A to Z of reflective practice on the screen in front of you. We're actually quite proud of this. I'm very proud of this, that Rosie drew this. Think it's uh, And it was done very last minute as well, finished literally as we uh, pretty much opened the webinar. Um, but this is the A to Z of reflective practice from the Social Work Student Connect team. We hope that you have um, had a bit of fun looking at the A to Z tonight, but also that we've learned something together about reflective practice. And it's always worth going back to the basics of reflection. So I know uh, because I did see the chat at the beginning that there's people here who are on their first year, just started their social work training. And I also know that there are people here who have been in social work for many, many years. And it's still always worth going back to the basics sometimes to revisit those basics. So we are gonna take a break for a little while. We will, um, I think it's gonna go into the chat now. The um, next webinar that we're going to be doing, uh, so our future webinars, we always end by uh, talking you through our future webinars. We've got a fabulous, uh, we've already got through up until um, the middle of April, all our dates booked in with guest speakers and so on. We've got a fabulous series of webinars um, next year, but we're going to start back again on the 13th of January and um, it'll be a back to the basics webinar. So we've called it back to the future because we'll be looking at the future webinars that we're doing, but we've called it back to the future and it'll be a, uh, we're not entirely certain on the content of that one yet because it will be an experiential uh, content, but we're going to do back to the future. And then on Wednesday, the 20th of January, we're going to be looking at a really interesting subject of uh, men in social work. And um, so we've got lots of uh, guest speakers that night as well. So, and we've got some fabulous sessions booked for you next year, but we are taking a break partly because people are saying, oh, you, you know, you need the rest. It'll be good. You can have the rest. But actually, we're going to take a break uh, and we, we've decided we'll announce tonight why we're doing it for various reasons we're going to tell you tonight but uh, we're going to be finishing off a book that we have been writing together as a team um, the handbook the essential handbook that we're going to uh, be producing and we're going to work hard together on that as a team and we've decided we need to have some time where we're not planning the webinars because there's a lot of work goes into doing these webinars um, from everybody on the team um, so we decided, well, uh, we're still actually going to be working on Wednesday nights, but we're going to be doing something slightly different. But we will be keeping in touch with you via social media. But we are this is our time and place for finishing off the book now. So we're going to take a few weeks to finish off the book and then we will be able to share that all with you in the new year. Um, but from my perspective, I uh, want to very much at the point that we're taking this break here, 26 sessions in, we've done the 26 letters of the alphabet of reflective practice. I want to thank the team for everything that they have done and everything they have brought to these sessions and to me and my own learning. Um, I'm going to put that back onto the screen, the 26 um points of reflective practice and is there anything in the chat that we need to know i've seen um cat just put a mic on so i assumed that meant needing to say something we've had a few people ask where they can buy the poster from they want to put it up in their office well uh that might be you you might find that the book comes with a couple of posters because we think that they could be very helpful so we will be finessing the posters um, and they will be with the book. I think that's the, the uh, message, Kat. And there was just one more. It's um, somebody's asked, could the coffee cup reader or the spiritualist be considered a reflective practitioner? And what differentiates between reflective social worker and a spiritualist? Well, that's a huge question. <laughs> and that's, uh, I don't know if we can actually uh, even answer that in a whole webinar. We'd need a whole webinar and more to answer that. I think that's there's elements there about um, cultural context within that that we would need to know in order to answer the question fully. Um, and yeah, I suppose I would just say that at this moment in time. So that would be something I would need to reflect on with some cultural context around it. 
Kelly's put a hand up. I don't know if you're waving, Kelly, or if you had an answer to the question. <laughs> no, no. Oh, God, definitely don't have an answer to that. That's beyond <laughs> me. Um, I just wanted to mention, a lot of you have said you don't know what you're going to do with your Wednesday evenings, but we won't have a webinar for you every Wednesday, but we will have um, a little video for you to watch that we will put on our social media. Um, so we'll have a short little video every Wednesday, something that you can watch and interact with but it won't be a webinar but there will be something on a wednesday so keep an eye on our twitter facebook and instagram there will be something for you don't worry okay fabulous thank you ever so Lovely. much everybody um so we look forward to seeing you all back again in january in the meantime have a um a fabulous time bye thanks everyone